Morning, all. Sorry to be the delaying factor, but I was busy glad handing outside, so it's not that I'm late. I just was distracted, but it was a good distraction. It's good to have all of you here today. We extend our greeting from the leadership team and the members and friends of Mountain View. It's exciting to know that uh, the reservations for this room fill up very quickly at the front end of the week, and that's encouraging to us that people want to be here to fellowship together in the name of Christ and to glorify his name together as we worship him. Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, one is that every week from 15 past eight to quarter to nine, we have a prayer time meeting in the library or the conference center over in that corner of the Summit Coffee Place. We encourage you to come, men and women, to pray with us and for us as we begin the Lord's Day that what happens in this room would honor God, would edify the saints and would the gospel would be made clear to those who do not know the Lord. We also have a prayer time on Friday morning for those who are strong in stamina and early birds. We meet at six o'clock in the morning, again in the conference center for a cup of coffee, time in the word, and then prayer time together. It's especially encouraging to see those men who get up early and make the effort to be over here, several of them on their way to their place of work. And so we begin the week on Sunday morning, we end the week on Friday morning with prayer, coming into the presence of God. Many of you know that we have opportunities to give both through the EFT and the SNAP scan, and uh, we will have a financial report later from Roger, but let me just say that uh, we are in need of the continued support of the constituents for Mountain View. Even though the numbers are limited for meeting in this room, uh, the expenses go on. It costs us just as much for 50 people as it does to have 150 people in the building. So please remember us, pray for us, pray that we would be good stewards of what God supplies to us and for us, and that those monies would be spent wisely. It's exciting to announce that we will be resuming MTC today. That is the first level MTC. Tonight we will be considering the walkthrough or the overview of the New Testament. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But the focus this morning is on the MTC2 or MTC Square. That is the second two-year program. And we have six people who are graduating. We want to present their certificates today. I'm not going to ask them to come forward due to the social restrictions and so on. But I would like for them to stand where they are and remain standing so that we as a congregation can congratulate them for this achievement. First is Portia Alexander. She and her husband have been confined at home because of COVID, and I believe that they are still uh, away from us. Edward Bennett, haven't seen Edward. Valencia Ghost, Mark is here today. 
Lynch is caring for her father and uh, other situations at home. Belinda just returned from holiday. Pastor Luke is in the booth. There we are. You are the first one to stand. Welcome. And Jenny Wollicott. So will you just congratulate all of these folks with a round of applause, expressing our appreciation. Just a word about these six. They completed four years of the MTC program, 16 different courses. In addition to that, everyone who is graduating today received somewhere during that four years uh, an ESV study Bible in honor of their perfect attendance. So these are people who really put forth the effort to be part of the MTC program and to uh, finish well. Again, tonight we will be meeting to begin the study of the overview of the New Testaments called On the Way with Jesus. We're meeting in the Summit Coffee Shop and we invite you to join us, even if you've not been in any of the MTC classes before. If you have an interest in knowing more about the New Testament, how it's put together, who wrote the books and to whom and why, uh, we invite you to join us. It'll be a great time and uh, we, want, we want you to uh, share in that with us. With regard to perfect attendance study Bibles, we have one to award this morning, and it's here on the table for Warren to pick up. So if you would come forward and grab your Bible, Warren, we congratulate you on having perfect attendance the last term of MTC. Will you join me in congratulating him? Thanks, brother. So you see there is an additional incentive for not only attending MTC, but for being there every week not just to win a Bible, but to absorb the uh, lessons that we learn together. Will you join me in prayer as we commit our time now to the Lord and trust him to meet with us as he has promised and to bless our time together as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Fathers, we come into your presence today. It is with joyful hearts. We are overjoyed because of your faithfulness to us. We celebrate your grace and your mercies that are renewed every morning. We are joyful because we are privileged to meet together in this room today. And even though the government may restrict us to a specific number, we're mindful that there are others who are watching online. There are others who would be here if they could, but because of health or limited accommodations or whatever it might be, they're unable to be with us. Thank you that the Forever Family at Mountain View is alive, well, healthy, forward moving and growing together in their likeness to the Savior. We are also overjoyed, Father, because it's a time for us to corporately worship you. The service is not about us. It's all about you. And we want our attention to be focused on you, our Father, as the Spirit enables us to worship you acceptably. We pray that he will move among us, that he will knit our hearts together in love, that he will promote our worship into your ears, into your eyes, and the sacrifices into your nostrils, that in all things you may be well pleased as we give this time, ourselves, and all that is programmed for this morning to you with thankful hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's um, start our New City Catechism this morning with a little bit of a quiz. Who can remember the two words, those big words that we did last week? One was something that Jesus has accomplished for us, and another thing is something that continually happens once we are saved. Can anyone remember? There was two, two words. <laughs> Not Nate. <laughs> Adrian. Justification. justification. Okay, so we said that justification is something that Jesus does for us. It has been done once and for all time. But then there was something that happens continually. Nate. <laughs> what was the other, the other word? Sanctification. Sanctification. Well done. <laughs> okay. And we're really going to build on, on that in this morning's question, question 33, which says, Should those who have faith in Christ seek their salvation through their own works or anywhere else? And this is really um, focusing on the, the term of justification. You know, what, are we, what are we justified through? So this question answers that and says, in response, no, they should not. As everything necessary to salvation is found in Christ, to seek salvation through good works is a denial that Christ is the only Redeemer and Savior. 
And Paul in Galatians 2.16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. So there's a lot of practical um, implications of this. This means that nothing that we do can save us. No church attendance, no Bible reading, no any you know, good works can save us, except by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to one of the contributors as they explain this a little bit better for us. If you mix faith and works, that is, if you say, yes, I have to have faith in what Jesus has done for me, but I also have to add this or this or this, or I'm not saved, then what you're saying is what really makes the difference, what really puts you over the top, as it were, what actually saves you is not what Jesus has done, but what, what you add, which makes you your own savior. This illustration might help. Mr. A asked Mr. B to make him a wooden cabinet because Mr. B was a great cabinet maker. Mr. A was a friend of Mr. Uh, Mr. B and Mr. A were friends and therefore Mr. B said, well, I better make this really good, perfect. So he worked and worked and worked on the cabinet till he got it to the place where it had been buffed and polished to perfection. He brought Mr. A into the workshop to see it and Mr. A picked up a piece of sandpaper and said, let me just add one little stroke. Mr. B said, no, it is finished. It's perfect. And there's no way to add to it without subtracting from it. Same thing with Jesus Christ's work, because when he died, he said, it is finished. There is nothing else to add to it. It's perfect. And if you add to it, you subtract from it. If you say, he did this, but I have to add this, that that you add becomes the real basis of your salvation and makes you your own savior. The Protestant reformers made strong biblical arguments that you cannot mix faith and works, that justification and righteousness and salvation must be through faith alone. I won't make any more of those arguments. I'll just say this personally, I couldn't live if that wasn't the case. I wouldn't have any hope unless I could get up every day and stand on the bedrock knowledge that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. That's my only hope. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have now to come together to worship you. Lord, as we've just heard, everything that, or the only way that we can be saved is through Jesus. And that's the reason that we're gathering this morning is to, to praise you and to worship you for providing Jesus um, to die for our sins. And Lord, I pray that even in this week as we, we may be tempted to add to that salvation, to um, perhaps do, do some works to, to better our salvation maybe in some ways, and that you would just remind us of this truth and to, to trust wholly on you um, for our salvation. Thank you for this opportunity that we have now to, to worship you, and I pray that you would quieten our hearts, that you would um, remove any distractions, and that you would help us to focus squarely on you this morning. We pray that everything that we do would glorify you. Amen. Good morning, church. Sure, that's my lad. <laughs> Sorry, my mic always gets moved when anybody uses it. So. We can just stand together now and worship the Lord.
said this morning, it is done, Father. There's nothing we can do. Thank you, Jesus.
my favorite parts of the service is for us to continue our reading through Psalm 119. This morning in my quiet time, Psalm 19, written by David, was part of the reading, and I could not help but think about Psalm 119 that really is a commentary on Psalm 19. One of the favorite stanzas is that which we are reading this morning, beginning with verse 105. Psalm 19, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I'm severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. And so Psalm 19, or Psalm 19 rather, ends with these words, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I pray that that will be true of us as our hearts, our words, even our thoughts are challenged and changed by the word of God. Good morning, Mountain View. And guests with us have to apologize. This is going to be our third try, I think, between different mics and battery packs. I know much of you have reminded us about our our audio issues, so apologies for all of these, and thank you for your grace and patience. Um, It is um, always a joy for us to come together I think we've all learned by now that we are, we are desperate for it. And maybe you've picked up on the themes as we've worked through Psalm 119, and, and we've, been, we've been working through it as a staff at Mountain View, and we've been praying through it on Friday mornings, excerpts from Psalm 119. Again, of course, this is the psalmist's uh, reflections and meditations on uh, his, his dependency, and so our dependency on the Word of God. Um, the delight that comes as we study the works of the Lord and as we, as we study and we understand Him and His ways, uh, the, the delight and the joy you hear in the psalmist as he talks about his, his meditation and his study of the law, and that leading into our declaration, or our praise, the, the natural outpouring of the joy and satisfaction we find in the Lord, and, and obviously as we primarily learn about Him through His Word. And so we have this blessed time and opportunity to get into that again now. And we are um, breaking from our series in 2 Corinthians to jump back into these series, these doctrinal series, as we preach through and work through and teach through Mountain View Baptist Church's own confession of faith. Um, You know, what we teach, what we believe about different aspects of theology, according to the Word of God. This particular article, as we've been just working through our articles, and that's a to you if you're interested in it, along with all of the, the Scripture references to where we, we come to these conclusions from God's Word on our website. As we take this break and we take a two-week series, we have now landed on the article in our Confession of Faith regarding angels. And that says, this is article three, we believe in the reality of angels, both good angels who serve God and evil angels who serve their leader, Satan. Angels are spirit beings created by God in the beginning. The angels were created to glorify God and carry out his will. Good angels are angels 
who did not follow Lucifer in his rebellion against God and were thereby confirmed in holiness, the holy angels are sent forth by God to minister to the heirs of salvation. Evil angels, through pride, one of the chief angels, Lucifer, rebelled against God and fell from his honored position, thus becoming the devil or Satan. In his revolt, he drew away with him a host of angels who fell with him. Both the devil and the fallen angels are the enemies of God and the believer today, but will one day be judged by God with everlasting punishment. I believe it's likely um, everyone listening now would confess a belief in the reality of angels. But I'm curious about something else, because that's good, because the Word of God and Jesus Himself affirm the existence of angels and their activity. In fact, I found out 34 of the Bible's 66 books make references to angels, 17 in the Old Testament and 17 in the New Testament. But I'm interested in this. I want to take a little poll. So um, despite our Baptist tendencies to keep your arms at your side, feel free to raise them in this case. Try to break the mold there a little bit. Um, and don't be embarrassed. But I wonder if most of us don't land on two sides of a spectrum regarding angels and demons. Okay, I'm going to tell you the two options. And I, I, I'm just curious on, on where you would say if you give yourself an honest reflection one is that um, we are either totally oblivious, living ignorantly, and unaware of the reality of the spiritual war being waged all around us. Or secondly, on the opposite side, so wholly, you know, basically living your life as if their existence is not legitimate. And then the, the opposite side where, where you might... Uh, over credit and give far too much uh, credit for all of the bad things in the world being the result of the enemy. Every sin you committed was, you know, the devil tempting me, the devil made me do it. Uh, so those being the two, the two spectrums, uh, basically ignorant and oblivious in how you live, or on the far side, giving the devil and his demonic forces credit for every single bad thing that happens in the world today. Um, if you're of, if, if you had to, to put yourself there, and, if, and you don't have to vote if you're, if you're somewhere in the middle and you've, you've got a proper theology of angels, um, would you, would, how many of you guys would say, if you, if you actually observed your life, you probably land more on the side that you live your life in a sense that's more oblivious or, or ignorant to the reality of the spiritual warfare being waged all around you on a daily basis. How many people would say they're more? I, I, if I'm honest with myself, I probably fall more on that side. I see a couple hands back there, okay. Um, and, and a couple others, all right. Okay, how about how many of you guys find yourself blaming the devil and demons for every bad thing that happens, every sin you commit, etc., on the other side of the spectrum? Uh, kind of even, actually. All right. And all the rest of you have it figured out. Well, the rest of you can go home. The others of you, I want to tell you the two sides of that spectrum, they're both wrong, um, dangerous, and unbiblical uh, to be on two opposite sides. But that's our agenda this morning is to work it out. And so by the nature of Luke having his birthday and allowing him to pick which of these he wanted to tackle, the faithful angels or the fallen angels, uh, his birthday being tomorrow, and it, nothing subtle about the balloons or anything that he did not set up there. That's honest. He didn't put those there, but it is funny. His birthday is tomorrow, and he's pretending like it's not. Um, we're going to start with the bad guys in this series. So I'm going to address fallen angels or demons this morning, and Luke will follow up next week with the good guys and the faithful angels. Um, So before we jump into that, let's do the most important thing we can possibly do today, and that is pray to the Lord to reveal his truth to us and what we are meant to do about it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time 
together. Thank you for adopting us into a family of brothers and sisters, um, making us heirs um, with the Holy Spirit as our guarantee, heirs in a heavenly kingdom, co-heirs with Christ. Thank you for the grace of, of adoption, of choosing, electing us, bringing us into this family, our time even this morning, Lord, to, to be together with our brothers and sisters, a family reunion of, of sorts, coming together again to be, to be blessed by the hearing and the proclamation of your word, Lord. And it is my prayer that your word is, is heard loud and clear, despite numerous distractions we both walk in with, and my own faults as an imperfect servant of yours, Lord, who by your grace, I pray that you would bless the hearing of your word now, remove any pride of my own that seeks to steal glory that you deserve, that you receive all the glory from our time together, and encourage us in our faith as we walk through a heavy and dark and depressing reality of our existence. May we walk out on the other side encouraged, stronger, refined by the realities and also the, the weapons you give us in this battle. Reminded again, you promise to never leave us, so who can be against us? Lord, we are more than conquerors because of your love in Christ. Thanks again. Help us to love you and help us to love others. Amen. Okay. As we start with the bad news, I'm just going to have to say this. Let me just get this out here right now. For those of you on the one side of the spectrum, angels and therefore fallen angels and demons are real. They're real. We see that throughout the Scriptures. And in order for us to deal properly with the reality of fallen angels or demons, I need to cover a little ground on angels themselves and clarify some of the truth. You guys, I'm sure, are aware of lots of false ideas and myths about angels and have seen various ridiculous and unbiblical images of what these beings look like. And I don't even want to get into that. Let's stick with what God says. Angel, the Hebrew word is malak, which means messenger or one who is sent. We see this particular word to describe them 103 times in the Old Testament. Or the Greek term and equivalent, angelos, is another similar word which also means messenger or messenger who speaks and acts in the place of one who sent them. In essence, angels... Are messengers. The New Testament writers use this Greek term 169 times in reference to spiritual beings. They're also referred to as sons of God in Scripture, a designation used for angels on a few occasions, and we'll look at that uh, especially in the book of Job. Another term used is holy ones. We see this in the Psalms especially, and that speaks to their sense of them being set apart. Remember to to be holy means to be set apart. Set apart by God and for God, some of which even attendance to God's glorious holiness. Also referred to as a hosts. On a number of occasions, large gatherings, quantities, even armies of these heavenly beings are referred to the hosts of heaven. The title attributed to God here references them as Lord of hosts, Lord of these heavenly armies, speaks to him being surrounded and having sovereign command over millions and millions of these angelic beings. As far as their character, we understand throughout the word that angels are created spirit beings, okay, not gods, like all of creation, the triune God spoke them into existence for the praise of his name. The psalmist writes in Psalm 148, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, 
Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Angels are created spirit beings. So which of the six days of creation were they created? Trivia question. Which of the six days of creation were the angels created? I don't know either. According to the Lord in his answering of Job in chapter 38, he answers Job from a whirlwind. Pardon me as I make my way there. These cold fingers don't turn pages very fast. In verses um, 4 through 7, the Lord speaking to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Another one of those references to these angel beings who were apparently present at the laying of the foundations of the earth. And were there rejoicing and marveling over the power and the creativity of God as he was doing it. As with all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, they were created through Christ and for Christ, according to Paul in Colossians 1, verse 16. Now, throughout their interactions with mankind, it seems that they appear in the form of some sort of human-like body. Yet these angels are created spirit beings, according to the scriptures, especially in Hebrews 1.14. They're ministering spirits. So they're capable of taking on other forms or these human-like bodies in which we see them appear to man. Yet they're incapable of death. Jesus, in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verse 36, says they cannot die. They're, they possess greater wisdom than man, according to 2 Samuel 14, 20, yet limited. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 36, about the hour of the second coming, right? Only the Father knows, not even the angels know, or himself, he includes in that comment. So they have greater, they possess greater wisdom than man, albeit limited, and they possess greater power than man, according to Peter in his second epistle. They're greater in might and power than mankind, yet also limited, as we'll see in Daniel chapter 10. That's some of the definitions, the characteristics, but there's also something interesting the Word reveals to us about these beings in that there are different classifications or rankings of them. The highest of which appears to be the cherubim. This is the highest class of angelic beings. They are proclaimers and protectors of God's glorious presence, His magnificent sovereignty, and His perfect holiness. We see them guarding the gate in grace at the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. Remember, as man is cast out after the fall in their sin, cherubim are assigned to guard the gate and the entry into the Garden of Eden as a protection of grace by God that they might not return and eat from the tree of life, right, forever immortalizing them in a corrupted state of sin. We also see them as fi figured as golden... Um, Golden images which, which cover the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant. So as the people of God are instructed to, to build the Ark of the Covenant, they're, they're instructed to build these cherubim figures whose wings touch above the mercy seat of which this would be placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, which would cover where the Lord would meet his people. Between these beings on either side of the ark, covering the mercy seat with their wings, 
Sorry. This is where the Lord would meet His people. That's in, his, in Exodus 25. And then we marvel at these extraordinary beings as they attend to the glory of God in Ezekiel's vision in chapter 1. And I want to share that with you. Listen. Here Ezekiel records what he is witnessing and starting in chapter 4. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness But each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands, and the the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward, turning. Each of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the one side, on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies, And each went straight forward. Wherever the Spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. Remember, they have four faces. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro from the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Okay, so I'm not sure how much that matches the images you have seen in movies, in cartoons, in other images, but this is how a human, Ezekiel, attempts to try to describe the cherubim. Another classification are the seraphim, which means fiery or burning ones. Isaiah's vision in chapter 6 gives us our best description of these wonderful divine attendants. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, in the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. These seraphims surround the throne of God and proclaim day in and day night the splendor of the holiness of God. Finally, there seems to be a, a, another, some, some sort of lower ranking angels, governmental rulers with different sorts of uh, domains and territories that they oversee on the earth that Paul refers to as thrones or rulers, powers, authorities, dominions. Maybe you can think of passages where all of those words are used to describe usually Jesus being above every name, including all the thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, nations, principalities, all of those terms perhaps you've not recognized before. We see it in Ephesians 1. 19 and 20. In which Paul is writing that uh, Christ 
being seated at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but the age to come. And there are other angelic ministries um, to mankind, which include angels that, uh, that, that work and are messen- messengers carrying out different sorts of messages and tasks, including protection, Uh, provision, encouragement, and direction, among other things. Uh, You can all think of stories, of course, of angels appearing to people with different instructions or doing different things. And other than that, we don't really have a whole lot more in the way of descriptions of these beings. And perhaps that's in a reason because we have a nature as humans to want to get caught up in the wrong things. So I say this as a caveat And we see in the New Testament as well, Paul and Peter addressing people getting obsessed with the wrong things. Whatever it is, however it is they appear, which seems to be in some sense human likeness, their brilliance always seems to strike terror and fear in the hearts of men, causing them to collapse and faint in many times. And while angels appear to be in all of this a a higher order than man, according to the author of Hebrews, in many ways, yet they're not created in the image of God. And this is where this will become applicable for us. They do not seem to share, certainly do not share in in redeemed humanity's glorious redemption in Christ. Recall that according to Peter, to Peter, In his first epistle, in chapter 1, the angels long and and look for, look to understand and grasp this gospel. They watch on in awe and wonder as all of this unfolds. They rejoice as sinners repent and turn to Christ. Jesus Christ did not suffer and die for the sins of angels, but of mankind. Angels are irredeemable. So then, what is to be said about fallen angels? And here we are at last with demons. Understanding demons are these same sorts of created spirit beings, albeit fallen and evil. If we don't understand all that I've just shared about angels, we can't grasp demons. And the story of demons begins with a particular angel, a particularly special angel, an anointed cherubim, as he's described. And you can make your way to Ezekiel if you want to follow along here. I'll be reading verses 11 through 17 of chapter 28. Here, again, addressing a sort of angelic, spiritual ruler of a demographic, it becomes very apparent Ezekiel is not receiving a word of the Lord regarding a human being. But the word says in chapter 11, of verse, of, uh, sorry, of chapter 28, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. Okay, so this is addressed to the king of Tyre, but you'll soon understand this is not a reference to a human. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, and you were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness 
was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. You see, this king of Tyre is a reference to something else, and the story begins to be put together further, as well as we see the prophet Isaiah seeing a vision that fleshes it out. What we know is there was some extraordinarily beautiful and and particularly wise cherub, blessed with a position of highest honor before the throne of God, yet found unrighteousness due to sinful pride. Isaiah goes on in chapter 14, in 12 through 15. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? Or your Bibles may say Lucifer in Hebrew. How are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Listen to the pride in these I will statements from Lucifer. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Lucifer, or Shining One, Star of the Morning, now known as Satan, which is Hebrew for adversary, became obsessed with his own beauty. His wisdom turned corrupt, and he sought to enter God's most glorious presence and establish his throne over God's throne. He wanted to make himself like the Most High, verse 14. However, as we've already heard, the seraphim proclaimed the truth, holy, holier than all, holiest, most holy. This leaves room for no other on the throne of God, most set apart. And so Satan was cast out, falling from his supremely high rank and leading along a host of other angels, perhaps as many as one-third, in a doomed-to-fail rebellion against the Lord. And all of this, before we meet the crafty serpent In the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Who would tempt and deceive Eve. Leading Adam into sin and rebellion also against God. So may it be known this morning Satan is not imaginary. He's not some sort of personification of evil. He's known by many names throughout scripture. As we've said Satan or adversary. Devil or slanderer evil one for his intrinsic wickedness, the great red dragon for being a creature of destruction, the serpent of old for his deception of humanity in Eden, Beelzebul or lord of the fly for his filth, Belial meaning worthless, god of this world, Paul says, as he controls how the world thinks, the world's philosophy, ruler of this world, Jesus calls him, as he runs the world system. Prince of the power of the air, ruling the lives of unbelievers, Paul calls him, our enemy or opponent. Tempter, soliciting people to sin. Murderer, leading people to eternal death. Liar, perverting the truth. Accuser, as he opposes believers before God in Revelation. Satan's involvement in human affairs is testified to throughout the Old and New Testament. Every New Testament writer makes reference to him, and Christ himself speaks of Satan 25 times. You must believe Satan is real. 
And you must know that he burns with anger against the Lord and anything that brings the Lord glory. You must know he is busy scheming and he is crafty in his work of redemption. uh, Excuse me, of deception. He is scheming and crafty in his work of deception. He knows the scripture and desires to defeat and take out Christians. You must be aware, you must be vigilant, and you must be prepared. These are my final three points and instructions in light of what we have learned about Satan. Peter writes this, Be sober-minded, meaning be alert, right? Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever amen be aware you have knowledge perception of fact be aware there is an unseen war raging at all times around us be aware of your enemy satan still leads a fight even though the battle has been won. He is still battling to control, continue to control and deceive the world and lead the nations against the Lord. And his control and rule are legitimate. Jesus was aware. Matthew 4, calling Satan the ruler of this world. Paul was aware in Colossians 1, 13 through 16, citing all of this, this dark angelic order, this governmental rule, which he references in letters to the Ephesians and the Romans as well. He grasped that there's a spiritual war over the world, and there are certain demons under Satan's control which seem to rule territories with varying power and authority. And Daniel was aware. Daniel saw a vision which caused him to collapse in fear, a terrifying vision of a figure which sounds much like how John describes in Revelation what he saw of the the glory of of Christ. Anyhow, he's fallen And collapsed with his face on the ground. And in verse 10 of chapter 10. And behold a hand touched me. And set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me. O Daniel man greatly loved. Understand the words that I speak to you. And stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me. I stood up trembling. Then he said to me. Fear not Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and you humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard and I have come because of your words. Now listen, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is not a human, withstood me 21 days. But Michael, the archangel, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Again, not referencing humans and came to make you understand what's happened to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. And in verses 20 and 21, then he said, do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what's inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except Michael, your prince. These are spiritual rulers, the throne, the rule, authority, power, and and dominion, as, as Paul likens them in the New Testament. This is the reality. Here is Daniel awaiting understanding from a messenger sent by God who was held up in answering this prayer and delivering this understanding for 21 days because he was busy battling 
demons until the archangel Michael came and freed him to go deliver this message to Daniel. This is the reality. The war is real. Please be aware. That's my first point this morning. Please be aware. Tell your neighbor, please be aware. Second, be vigilant. Be alert. Be watchful for danger and or difficulties. I am aware, but what do I do about it? Be vigilant. If you're being stalked by a lion you cannot see, what do you do? Hopefully first look out. What shouldn't you do? Go running around screaming, trying to hunt a lion you cannot see. Remember, it's not just the lion we must be concerned about. Satan is a very real and present danger to us, but he's not just one. What about his countless fallen angels and demons? He leads an evil army of God-hating, God-rebelling spirits who have nothing left to lose. Be vigilant. They're involved in inflicting disease, influencing the mind by perverting truth, blinding the mind from reasoning, leading even believers away from single-minded devotion to Christ. They deceive people to sin. They snatch the seed of the gospel from unbelievers, and they lead the nations in rebellion against Christ. These desperate acts of this doomed-to-fail rebellion include even demonic possession of humans. I like this definition from Charles Ryrie as it also compares demonic possession with the demonic influence or oppression. Demon possession, a demon residing in a person, exerting direct control and influence over that person with certain derangement of mind and or body. Demon possession is to be distinguished from demon influence or demon activity in relation to a person. The work of the demon in the latter is from the outside. In demon possession, it's from within. So by this definition, a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon since he is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. However, a believer can be the target of demonic activity to such an extent that he may give the appearance of demon possession. While we are at war against demons with supernatural wisdom, remember they're not omniscient. Only the Lord is all-knowing. While we are at war against fallen angels with superhuman strength, remember they're not omnipotent. Only the Lord is all-powerful. And while we're at war against an invisible spiritual enemy, they're not omnipresent. Only the Lord is all-present. And Christian, remember this. This Lord is ever present with you and nothing can separate you from his love in Christ. Yet we must always be alert for satanic deception in the form of false teaching aimed at weakening the authority of Scripture and distorting biblical truth, leading people astray. Even as Paul wrote to Timothy, we expect that these false teachers and demonic doctrines will increase as the return of the Lord approaches. We must also be alert for satanic deception in the form of passivity. Christians just being idle, waiting and waiting on things the Lord hasn't told them or, or that they ought to be revealed to them. A passivity is a false view of faith that would have a person quench all personal actions of mind, judgment, reason, and will, as well as other forms of activity, waiting passively for God to move him or her. This passive, unguided, mindless attitude opens the door for all kinds of demonic influences. Never for a moment should we cease thinking. Cease evaluating, cease deciding, cease resisting evil, cease trusting, or cease obeying God. This is faith being led by the Spirit of God in obedience to the Word of God. And we must be alert for satanic deception in the form of a quick fix. See, as already mentioned this morning, the prosperity gospel preachers of the day proclaim a lie that instantly promises to cure all your ills. You should have instant material wealth and sudden spiritual perfection. That is a lie of the devil. Our sanctification throughout Scripture is likened to a walk with Jesus. And so our growth is often slow and sometimes a stumble. 
but never is it instant perfection. We must submit to the Lord daily, study his word, and step in obedience. Please be alert. Tell your neighbor, please be alert. Or wake them up and tell them, please be alert. Nate's on his last point. Finally, brothers and sisters, be prepared. Be aware, be alert, and be prepared. Look, this is dark. This is depressing. But there's good news. We have not been left on our own or even left to our own devices. As James instructs, Satan can be resisted. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It may take four attempts. Remember, the temptation of Jesus, it may be a number of times he comes, but he will flee. Paul gives us instructions in Ephesians chapter 6. And I'll end here. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. How do you do that? Strengthen yourself daily. Study God's word. Be aware. Be alert. Live by faith and obey. The enemy is going to try to disrupt your daily fellowship with the Lord. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For, be aware, be alert, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt of truth with, which holds all of our armor together, as the Lord said, set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is is Christ. The truth is the word of Christ. Fasten on the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is this the state of being or doing right. And as we've worked through 2 Corinthians 5, we understand that as, as in an act of substitution, Christ became sin and we became the very righteousness of God. So now we must, by the power of God, live up to the standard we have attained and do right. Do the works, the good works God's prepared beforehand that we may do them. As for your shoes, for your feet, put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We need to be willing, prepared for action, prepared to proclaim the gospel of peace. The enemy wants to silence the gospel, but we mustn't be ashamed knowing that the gospel is the power to save all who believe, Romans 1.16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The shield of faith, biblical, practical faith, in the truth of Scripture, which one must first know, the truth of Scripture and God's promises contained in it, this will shield us and protect us from the enemy's arrows of fear, bitterness, and doubt. And take the helmet of salvation. Know, have a deep grasp of salvation. Throughout the series, we've been saying, soak savor and share, immerse ourselves in the word, meditate until it becomes a delight in us and we desire to share it. Have a deep grasp and understanding for salvation. Be assured and experience deliverance from sin daily in light of the gospel. Satan wants you to doubt, wants you to be ignorant to the power of the gospel to save and the sword of the Spirit. This is the word of God, which is the word of God.
We must know it, obey it, depend upon it, and by the power of spirit for effective use. Satan wants to distract us and keep us from the word and offer us worldly counsel. So we put on this armor, and in verse 18, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end. Keep alert with all perseverance. Be aware, be alert, be prepared. Make supplication for all the saints. Pray all the time. What do we do when he does attack? Stand firm in the face, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Pray. Recall when, when, when the disciples were sent out to, to perform miracles as a sign that the kingdom had come in Christ, was coming in Christ, and when they struggled to cast out demons, what was Jesus' solution? This one only comes out in prayer. Our strongest weapon against the enemy is the most humiliating thing for us to do, and that's for us to fall on our knees and say, we can do nothing, God help us. Pray all the time. And verse 19, and also pray for me, this is Paul speaking, but also for us that words may be given for us in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Pray all the time and be prepared as well to proclaim the gospel, which is our helmet of salvation, which is the truth and the promise that's going to protect us in this armor of God against the attacks of the enemy. Remember, your mission is to make disciples of all nations. You're not called to cast out demons. You are to call people to repent of their sins and tell them to turn in faith to God. This is the gospel. Remember, the victory is won. And some of these demons are already confined, but eventually Satan and all of his fallen angels will be judged. We see that in Revelations 20.10 when they're cast into a lake of fire, tormented day and night forever and ever. But also in this last, worth, this last verse that I'll end with, as Jesus tells a parable about the final judgment, likening the righteous from the unrighteous as the sheep and the goats, and he separates them, telling the sheep to inherit the kingdom of God prepared for them from the foundation of the world. And to those on his left, he says in verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You see this morning, each of us also has the same choices that the angels found themselves in. A choice or a decision to remain and, and receive Christ and receive him as our master and our Lord, or in pride, for us to rebel against the Lord and live for self. I pray this morning that you have been encouraged despite the dark nature of this message about a dark reality that is true, but do please remember and don't lose sight of a victory that has already been won. All of the tools and resources available to us, revealed to us in the word. Get into this daily. Immerse yourself. Continue to preach the gospel to yourselves because the doubts and bitterness that'll come. And you know it. And many of you guys are battling through this right now. Many of us are questioning the goodness, questioning the mercy, questioning the grace of God. Be reminded of the truth. There is nothing that can separate us, no height nor depth. And in that passage, Paul also says, no powers, none of these authorities, none of these other spiritual forces can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, what a difficult message. 
a dark reality to have to work through this morning. But it's true, Lord, and we understand that you ordain all things for the good of those who love you and for your glory. And as it's still yet a mystery and there's only so much we grasp and so much you have revealed about these things, may we be content there and not permit ourselves to go further exposing ourselves to demonic influence and demonic force by seeking out more about this dark realm and this dark world, albeit it is temporary, Lord. Thank you for a victory that is won, that we know in part that our salvation is here. We have the Holy Spirit in us. If we have confessed and acknowledged our status as sinners, as, as your enemy, and yet also received your free offer of salvation of your, and answered your plea of reconciliation as we've been speaking about, Lord. And, and for those who haven't, we also call them out to, to be reconciled to God. This wrath that's reserved for the devil and his angels is the same eternal destiny reserved for all of those who rebel against you, humans included. Yet it's not for lack of an alternative. Because of your richness and in your mercy, you have offered salvation, made a sacrifice available in Christ for us if we would just receive it. If there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that hasn't yet received your word, I pray, even today, Lord, that you would save those hearts, that you would draw those sinners in, and and we would rejoice even as in, in heaven the angels rejoice when a sinner repents and turns in faith to you. That's what we're doing. That is our mission, Lord, to make disciples of you, to call people to turn from their sin and follow after you. We trust that that time is coming. When all of this, all sin will be vanquished and dealt with. But in the meantime, may we be found faithful. May we be aware of the reality, alert and prepared to face our adversary, the devil, to face the temptations that he brings, Lord. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.